But the Maya aren't the only civilization to have faced climate upheaval during the last 2,000 years. 500 years after their collapse, the Northern Hemisphere was hit by the Little Ice Age. And on the south coast of Greenland, two very different societies found themselves in the firing line. Climate scientist Joy Singaraya has come here to find out what happened to them when they were hit by the biggest freeze since the last ice age. This has to be the most amazing landscape I've ever been in. Where's all this ice coming from? The well, ice is all falling from the core glacier you see out front, just breaking off the shelf as it's glaciers protruding into the fjord. The same extraordinary vista would have greeted the founders of the first of the two communities. They were a band of Norse adventurers from Norway. In around AD 985, they landed somewhere on this stretch of coast and established an extraordinary outpost of medieval Europe that would last for 400 years. Back home in Norway, the Norse had been livestock farmers, but farmland was in short supply, and they'd come here in search of fresh, uncrowded pastures. They found them in abundance. This would have looked somewhat like now, covered in grass, so this would be the winter fodder. So they'd cut this down at the end of the summer and then keep it so that the animals had something to eat over winter. Yeah, exactly. By the 1200s, there were as many as 300 thriving farming settlements along a 400-mile stretch of the southwest coast. And the population had grown to around 5,000. They were a pretty sophisticated bunch. Although the European mainland was almost 2,000 miles away, the Norse farmers tried to live a cultured European lifestyle. They so were always oriented towards the continent, so from the magnificent collection of medieval everyday clothes we know from houses, we can see that the, the trend, the style trend in the hoods of these dresses are actually following the style in Europe. So they like to keep up with the fashions on mainland Europe? They do their best to keep up with mainland Europe. What they couldn't make or grow locally, they imported. Luxuries like furniture, jewellery, books, even their own bishop. So in the early 12th century, they brought a bishop all the way from Norway. All the Greenlandic bishops were from Norway, which is something spectacular. In fact, nestling between the houses of the modern village of Igaliku are the remains of the bishop's estate. And it was pretty grand. At its heart, a great hall where the bishops themselves lived, Nearby quarters for clergy, farmhands and servants. Workshops. Huge warehouses for storing goods given as taxes. And of course, a cathedral. Not quite the grandest in Europe, but it was built in stone. It had glass windows and a bell tower. And was large enough to accommodate a congregation of hundreds. So we just walk into the church. People have been coming in from the mountains from each side and maybe from across the fjord. And there would have been a great gathering and the church bells ringing and people coming in from the both sides riding on horses in their best dresses. Oh, so yeah. quite an occasion. When you're living so spread out in the landscape, it would have been a, a really important part of everyday life coming from us. 
The Norse had created a little pocket of medieval Europe in the unlikeliest of places. But how would they fare when climate change turned their pastoral paradise into an icy desert? As our ancestors progressed from the Stone Age to the Modern Age, they became better at almost everything. But did their increasing sophistication make them more or less able to cope when the climate changed? Joy Singarayas come to Greenland to investigate how two neighboring societies reacted very differently to a brutal freeze some 600 years ago. She's discovered how one of them, the Greenland Norse, established a thriving outpost of medieval Europe in the lush pastures here. Now she's off to meet the neighbors. Local historian Re Oldenburg is going to show her the nuts and bolts of a very different way of life. Here you have a site of more than 20 houses from, from, a, from a long period, 300 years. But this is the one that's, that's interesting right now. And how old is this one? It's from around 1350 to 1400. Mm -hmm. And you have, it's a round house with the entrance starting right here. And will you follow me? Yes. yes. You have to bend because the ceiling is very low. Okay. Now we'll enter. Be careful. So they would have had to crawl in here yes, to get in the house. Very much. Yes. Now the people who lived in this house were Inuit. So they would be sitting on the benches, making sure the women that the fire was working, yeah. and the men would be taking care of their tools, only dressed in little pants because of the heat. <laughs> it would have been yeah. quite cosy then. Their ancestors migrated here from northern Canada from about AD 1200, more than 200 years after the Norse arrived. Around 500 of them settled on both the east and west coasts of Greenland. The island was now home to two cultures, the Inuit and the Norse, living side by side, but poles apart. Because the Inuit led a lifestyle completely foreign to their Norse neighbors. They were semi-nomadic hunters and fishermen, used to roaming a hostile landscape in search of prey. Instead of the latest European fashions so valued by the Norse, the Inuit wore animal skins. Instead of luxuries, they possessed only what they needed to survive. And their most important buildings weren't for the glorification of God, but for the storage of food. What's that? That's a meat cache, actually. Probably it's for whole animals to be preserved. Such as what? It can be either hooded whale or the Greenland shark. So you'd have kept one whale or one, one shark one, for the well, whole a couple, six months? A, a couple of, of whales or sharks in here. And, and a couple of whales there, perhaps yeah. four or, or, or six very large animals. The Norse and the Inuit coexisted uneasily for about 150 years, each side sticking rigidly to their own way of doing things. And then, around AD 1350, the climate began to change. We call it the Little Ice Age. For reasons scientists still don't fully understand, a 400-year spell of cold weather began to grip the Northern Hemisphere. In Europe, the average winter temperature fell by two degrees centigrade, cold enough to freeze the River Thames in London. Further north in Greenland, as temperatures dropped, an already tough climate 
became brutal. Both the Norse and the Inuit were in for a rough ride, and only one of them would survive. The main challenge for the Inuit was sea ice. As the temperature dropped, the fjords froze. Hunting grounds became harder to reach. But the Inuit already had the tools and strategies to deal with the challenge. They would travel following the prey. They had two kinds of boats that could take them out on much or lesser ice. Boats that could be used for different kinds of hunting. They couldn't go out in an open boat sometimes, but then they would do hunting from the ice, for instance. They were ice hunters. They had techniques for all kinds of prey. They had special tools for special animals. And they, they could actually take everything in the land and in the sea. The Little Ice Age was, it seems, no big deal for the Inuit. The Norse, though, found it a much tougher challenge. Christian and his colleague Konrad Smirovsky are excavating a Norse settlement not far from the bishop's estate at Igaliku. In rubbish tips or middens left by the Norse, they found evidence of a desperate struggle for survival. The increased amount of sea ice have reduced the growing season of grass and vegetation. Therefore, the firing is much harder than before. For instance, they would have had catastrophic winters which would crop sheep populations drastically. Just over one winter, maybe killing off half the sheep and goat numbers. Wow. If you have a series of those winters, you really start to feel the strain. Uh, to try to subsidize for that, they would go out and hunt uh, more seals. So uh, we see increased amount of seal bones as compared to the domestics. I see these are all seal bones. Really? These are all seal bones. But hunting was only ever a sideline, and old habits die hard. The Norse farmers couldn't or wouldn't give up what they knew. For example, this is a sheep bone, and it's broken in half for marrow extraction. So the farming continues as a way of life until the end. Can you say that they're adapting at all to climate change? I think this, the, the increased amount of sealing, yes, uh, but farming still continues as a way of life, as a cultural trait and as a way of securing food. They're trying to carry on the farming despite the hard conditions. What were the final years like for the people living here? It must have been turning very bleak in here, but some would have clung on for just the last bit. The old farmers who would spend all their life farming would probably not have left that farm that easily. Some would have stayed to the bitter end. Nobody knows how many Norse died because of the changing climate, but by around AD 1450, the entire population was gone. The only trace they'd ever existed, a few crumbling remains. The Inuit, on the other hand, are still here. And today, they make up around 90% of the island's population. Before the advent of farming, our ancestors, like the Inuit, were nomadic. When they wanted food, they moved to where it was. But we're trapped in villages and towns and cities. We can't move which, as the Norse found out the hard way, is a real problem when the climate changes. Their supposedly more civilised way of life actually made it harder, not easier, for them to adapt. But for some societies, even wholehearted adaptation may not be enough. <laughs> 